My name is Milbury Polk, and I'm currently based in just outside of New York City. My background is uh, I was born in Oxford in England and grew up between Europe, Egypt, and America, which probably formed a lot of my current interests. I went to the University of London to Queen Mary College for a year, and then I went to Harvard University. And from there, I started a very unusual path forward. I was a uh, photojournalist. And now, of course, that job as a photojournalist is much changed when, since, since I was doing it back in the um, 70s and 80s. And I had a very pivotal experience. I was working with Margaret Mead at the American Museum of Natural History and had all my exams and papers done, ready to, to go off to Oxford for my PhD in anthropology. And she took me aside and said, why are you wasting your time? And I, I was just stunned because that had been my goal for so long to, to do that. And she said, you know, when you get out, you're going to be in debt. All of the really interesting places have already been claimed by men, so you won't be allowed to go study the people you really want to study. You'll be end up in some second-rate college, and you'll be very frustrated. So I think you already know what you want to do, and just go do it. And that was some of the best advice I've ever had. And what I really wanted to do was to retrace part of the route of Alexander the Great. And that had been something that I'd been interested in since I had been in, in boarding school. I wrote a paper on Alexander the Great, and I'd been, of course, living in Egypt and traveling quite a bit around the Middle East. And he was really one of my heroes, um, along with Sir Richard Burton. I didn't know about the women at that point, but those two were the, were, were the heroes of my life. I wanted to model my life on them, just going everywhere, experiencing everything, meeting all different kinds of people. Um, so I went down to National Geographic and I gave them this idea to retrace part of his route across the Western desert of Egypt. It was the only part of his great expansionist route um, to India and back when he conquered the then known world that is in dispute because people didn't know if he'd gone through the desert, which was faster, but very dangerous, or if he'd gone along the coast, which was longer, but, but, um, much safer with his army. So we got together a small group. Um, there were seven of us and we wanted to go like he would have gone on camelback and we made our own saddles. We went out to the edge of the Western desert and then guided by the then best known smuggler in the area who really knew all the back trails, we headed out into the desert. And we did find Greek inscriptions. I don't know if they were from Alexander's troops or not, but we did prove that it was possible to have gone this way. Um, most of the wells along the route had been long ago sanded in, but they had existed during the time of Alexander. And so that started me on a whole career of um, putting together my own expeditions and trying to sell them to magazines. And in those days, there were many more magazines than there are now. Now everything's almost all online. Um, and I went, I did a lot of different projects in, in Asia and a lot in the Middle East. Um, I did a book in Saudi Arabia. I traveled all around the country and really had a, had a, a lot of amazing experiences on the road working working as a writer and photographer. It sounds in incredible. I, were you adventurous as a child? Did you want to grow up to be sort of an explorer? Was that one of your dreams? I think so. Um, I know that when I was five, my father um, picked me up when I was walking along the road. We lived outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and I had, I was then, um, really wanted to be Annie Oakley. And I had a cap gun and I, I liked bologna. And so I packed up bologna into my handkerchief and put it in a stick. And I was walking down the road with my cap guns, trying to figure out how to get out West. And my father just pulled over and said, get in the car. And that was the end of my first major expedition. But he took me on many, many trips. He was, he was really, um, my mentor, my best friend, my guide, he was the one that pushed me to do all kinds of things. When I um, 
was graduating from high school, um, <laughs> he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I really wanted to be a guide in the wilderness. And I'd gone to a um, pretty Tony East Coast American girls boarding school. And so this was not the sort of thing that any of my friends wanted to do at that time. And the day after I graduated, I got on a plane with my, I still had my, my dress and my little suitcase. Um, and I flew out to Alaska to a guide training program. And I had applied to it just using the name M. Polk, because as I later discovered when I wrote, I wrote a big book on the history of women in exploration, a lot of women resorted to using their initials because if they were known as Anna or Mary, they would never get the job. But if they were known as A or M, they had a shot, at least until the person met them. And when I got off the plane in Anchorage on my way out to meet this group of people that we were all going to go for training, the, the cab driver looked at me in my little dress, flowered dress, in my little suitcase and said, that's not a part of Anchorage I want to take you to. And I said, well, that's the address. And it turned out to be a, um, an area that was filled with uh, buildings for commerce and industry and, you know, just not, not, there are no hotels, no restaurants, nothing around. And I got, got to the door of the building of the right number and there were people sitting on the ground pouring things into bags, which I later found out they were, they were assembling all the food for the expedition, but I didn't know what they were doing. And they all looked up at me and they looked, they looked really raunchy and they said, what do you want? I said, well, I'm M Polk. And from inside the dark room, I heard this, oh shit. <laughs> so that was my introduction to, to that adventure. And, um, I went on, I was one of the two of two people on that trip that passed and got the guiding license. So, which made everybody else very angry because there were ex seals there. There were all kinds of people that had had much more experience than I, I of course had, but I had done a lot of camping by that point and I'd rafted down the Grand Canyon. I'd of course been in lots and lots of desert camping in Egypt and hiking and been a lot of places in the world. So I wasn't a complete neophyte, but um, that was a very interesting, interesting um, experience. And I went on from there to do lots of other things. What was it like being a photojournalist in the 70s and the and the 80s, sort of, you know, spending time out in Asia and in the Middle East? What were the realities of that like? You know, I think in, in retrospect, it was a lot easier to do it then than it is now. At the time that I was traveling in the places that I was traveling to, and I really began much earlier when I was working as a photographer, I got my first assignments when I was only um, 18 and 19, just because I happened to be in Yemen or I happened to be someplace. But in those days, you could really go a lot of places where, that you can't go now. And America was still considered to be the good guy. And women were still afforded a great deal of courtesy as long as you respected the cultural standards of wherever you were. And I think that that's an incredibly important thing for people that want to travel, that they respect where you are. So you don't wear shorts and T-shirts in a lot of countries. You don't – there's just a lot of things that you, you don't do because you don't want to get people mad and upset. You You want to – figure out a way where you can merge into their society and learn from them, not confront them. So I, I remember when I was doing a, <laughs> a story on the Jordanian army, they wanted me to do a calendar. And I was woken up really early one morning and they said, okay, we have everybody assembled. And I said, for what? They took me out to a parade ground and I had hundreds of men all in columns waiting to be told what to do, how to march, how to do whatever. And I, I was just a little bit stunned that I had this kind of, they said, you tell them what you want them to do. And I said, okay, well, march to the right. And they all, you know, just turned and marched to the right. I said, stop. They all stopped. And I was taking pictures and moving around. And it, it just, it was um, 
a, a situation like that that would never happen today. And there were many things like that. And in Saudi Arabia, I, I went absolutely everywhere. I had somebody who was helping me, but I, I, it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. And I, I loved Saudi Arabia and I loved Yemen. You know, I think of when I think of what's happened in Yemen today, it's just heartbreaking. I did the first postcards of Yemen. I still have lots of them. So if any of your listeners want any postcards of Yemen, just let me know. When I think of those beautiful cities and beautiful buildings and really lovely people and how they're starving to death now and the cities have been bombed and it's just it's just a tragedy. Really, it's a human tragedy and it's a tragedy for all of us because there was so much history and culture in that in that little end of the world as there is actually everywhere but it very unique and it's going to be all destroyed and it's very very sad and you we see this all over the world now part of globalization is is another thing that was on the rise of course when i was starting to work but not in such um full force as it is now i remember once being up on the border of burma and thailand way in the far north in a very remote village and taking pictures and talking to the people. And, and one little boy jumped out and said, Rambo, USA, Rambo. And he started like he had a machine gun, pretending his stick was a machine gun. And I thought, oh, my God, how does this child know about Rambo way up here? And it turned out that he had seen the film. Somebody had shown him somehow on a film and the whole village knew about Rambo and it made me really really sad that that was their impression of America America was Rambo and me being there being an American I was a representative of Rambo that kind of thing I mean that's what globalization does and I just wish that we could figure out a way to export what was really good instead of these other things that really um stir up so many negative emotions yeah how has exploration changed do you think over over the past sort of 40 50 years from from when you started out to what it is now exploration is always an evolving thing and exploration has been part of humanity since well probably before we were human i believe that we have exploration encoded in our dna and you think about all of the early movements of humanity all throughout the world and their desire to see what's over the next hill, to try to understand connections between things, to really understand the world. It's been the driving motive for humanity always. And of course, the negative as aspects of that have been there too, of exploitation and other things. But the true ex explorer is somebody who's driven by curiosity. And that's something that we're all born with. And it's very important for those of you that have children is to really, really encourage their curiosity. So exploration for, for a long period of time, of course, was focused on geographical information and just finding new territories, finding new new things out there, new animals, new whatever. We're still looking for that. But it's it's also switched in some ways to trying to really find out connections and connections are vital because if we don't understand the role that every single thing plays in the web of life and we just go about destroying things we don't know what the end result will be and of course now where we are in the world is in a very precarious place. Some people say, some scientists say that we've got about another 10 years before we really, we're really going to be in, in a very bad place. So the role of an explorer is somebody who's out on the edge learning and driven by their questions to find answers. And those answers will come back and inform the rest of us so that hopefully then politicians and other people will make the right decisions based on the things that explorers are finding. And of course, technology has has um, exploded the whole field. And when you think about DNA and all kinds of things like that, it's very, very exciting. Yeah. You talked earlier about, you know, your heroes, Alexander the Great, Sir Richard Burton. When did you start discovering 
you know, female explorers? When did you start becoming aware that oh my God, women go on these journeys of discovery and women explore and adventure? When did, you know, when did that happen for you? I, I got married and I didn't think that was going to, ch- it didn't change my life. And then I got pregnant and I was, did a lot of my work in Saudi Arabia, very pregnant. And I thought, well, I'll just, as soon as the baby's born, I'll just put her on my back and continue to go. But, um, it, it, the realities didn't work out that way. And I started to get very frustrated. And a friend of mine said, well, why don't you look at women explorers? And that was very novel to me because I hadn't really, I, of course, I knew Margaret Mead. I knew about Amelia Earhart and, you know, a handful of the people that you, one knows about. But in my travels, I rarely, if ever, met any other woman doing what I was doing. And I met men doing what I was doing, but I rarely met women. And so I started looking around and I would go to dinner parties and people would say, what are you doing? And I'd say, well, I'm trying to discover more about women explorers. And everybody would say, well, there aren't any. And then I met, I had my first experience with um, somebody at a dinner party again, said, well, there's this crazy woman who wanted to parachute into the Amazon naked so that the, the people wouldn't think that she was a threat. And that sounded very strange to me. And I ended up finding the woman. Her name was Nicole Maxwell. And she was a very, very interesting person. And she was really one of the founders of the field of ethnobotany. And she'd gone down to the Amazon area into Peru during World War II and became a society writer for their for their magazine. And they sent her off on a story to Iquitos on a new opera house. And while she was there, she did the obligatory trip up part of the tributary of the Amazon to look at the native people. She told me later that when she stepped ashore, she felt, and I, I've noticed that in my subsequent research that a lot of women have had this, probably men too, just a moment where everything coalesces and comes together. It's a, a, a special moment. And she knew that she was in a place she was supposed to be. She just felt right. She didn't know what it was. And the boatman came and said, okay, it's time to go back. And she said, no, I think I'm going to stay here for a while. And he said, you can't do that. And she said, yes, I'm going to stay. You can come get me in a week. And during that time, she writes about um, observing various people had various accidents and she saw what they, what plants they used. And it ended up changing her career. And she wrote a wonderful book about all the medicines that she observed. She spent years in the Amazon after that. And this is what often happens to women. Is her, the name of her book was The Witch Doctor's Apprentice. So it was filed in libraries under the occult instead of botany or instead of exploration or Amazonia. And she also discovered that the women were using a particular plant that helped them not get pregnant. And she was, this was late 1950s. And she was very excited about this because she thought this is an answer to problem that plagues women the world over. And she took the plants back to America and went to a prominent pharmaceutical company and said, look, I've found this plant. It's used. I've, you know, it has no side effects. It's wonderful. And it prevents pregnancy. And they said, thank you very much. We're going to send you back down there to bring back more plants. And she did that. And she signed a non-disclosure agreement with them. And, of course, they buried it because they were working on the pill. And so that plant never came to the light of day until until much, much later. So that's the kind of thing that uh, that kind of story I've seen in different feels happen over and over again. But anyway, to get back to this, I eventually I now have a library of about 1500 books on women explorers throughout the world and across time. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, because one thing that women always have done is they've written about their work. Usually there's no second edition, but it's still there's a record and I would always encourage people whatever their cultures, look at your cultures. Because I I tried when I was researching my book, Women of Discovery, I went to India to try to find women from India that I could include. And the libraries were just almost impossible to work in at that time. They were very disorganized. 
And of course, this was not a subject that you could just go, and it still is not a subject you can go to any any library anywhere and say, I'm interested in women explorers. And that's why I've been trying, without any success, is to have my library be the core of a women explorers library somewhere that at a university that they could just keep adding to. Because in most places, these books would be dispersed into their regular area, and you'd never have a way of finding who the women aviators were, or who the women ichthyologists were. They, they'll all be lost in the library. So it's important that it stay together as a collection. And women explorers exist in every culture in every period of time. So it, it's something to remember no matter where you are in the world there are amazing women that are there. And if you learn their stories and learn the odds that they overcame, it will give you you the courage to pursue the things that you want to do. Because a lot of these women were, were um, they just were driven by their passion. And that's the other thing that every every person needs to discover what their passion is in life. And your passion can be as small as, as as a lady I met in Texas who liked to make pies, but those pies were her ticket to a bigger world. If she took her pies to a, a homeless shelter, and at the homeless shelter she met fascinating people she never would have met otherwise that came from all different parts of the world, and it just launched her on a whole new life. So it, it can be a scientific endeavor, it can be a personal endeavor. But whatever it is, it has to be, you have to discover what that thing is that makes you want to get out of bed in the morning. And for a lot of people, that's a very difficult thing to identify. So that's one thing I would tell everybody. And once you do that, it launches you on a wonderful adventure. How did you discover your passion? Oh, well, I, you know, from a very young age, I just, I read everything and I was fascinated by history. I started actually with with Tolkien. When I was eight, my father gave me The Hobbit, and he had known Tolkien at Oxford. And I just was became enthralled with Tolkien's world and, of course, read everything I could get my hands on after that. And although that's a magical world, it's not unlike a lot of things that are analogous to to regular world of learning about other cultures and peoples and lands and figuring out how things work and so that um, you know each thing is is a step by step process. Tell me a little bit more about Wings World Quest and how that was founded. I know it's had a few sort of different iterations throughout the, throughout the years, but where did the idea start from? Well, it really started when I was working on Women of Discovery, and I started it with a very dear friend of mine, Leela Hadley Luce, who was herself an explorer and and an amazing writer. And we realized that something had to be done for women. And we, we put together this, it started first as an oral history project because I wanted to collect the oral histories of some of these women I was meeting that were getting to be quite elderly. And then it evolved into something where we wanted, I wanted to make an impact. I wanted to not just give awards, but to give cash awards. So we started giving $10,000 each to the women that we were highlighting. And I worked really hard on, on publicity for them. And I did a lot of lecturing in schools and created schools programs using their life and work as examples. And I created a what trading cards like baseball cards, but only these are women explorer cards and gave away thousands of them to schools and and museums, kids and kids love collecting these cards and they didn't kids, especially boys collected them. They didn't really care that it was a girl on the card, What they cared was, Oh, look, there's a T-Rex or there's a shark or there's a, whatever it is. And then they'd learn about the person who was doing the work and it just became part of what they knew they weren't discriminatory at all and so then I started really focusing more on education because I realized that's the only way we're going to change this difficulty that women have and still have and they probably will have for a while of reaching parity although I must say looking at the young women in the explorers club where I'm fairly active 
half of the new members of the Explorers Club are women, and they're doing exceptional things, really exceptional things. And I have a program all this year, each month, highlighting women that are doing amazing things, and most of them are young, and they're doing things that I, I couldn't have dreamed of doing when I was their age. We just had a program on women of Antarctica. We're having another one in a couple of weeks on women of the deep. And you can see this at, at the explorers.org website, which is all free. And the women of the deep, they're women down mapping the bottom of the ocean right now. In fact, the world's ocean floor was mapped by a woman and she wasn't allowed to work with the men. They'd give her all the data. She couldn't go on the ships. They gave her the data and she had to work from midnight to six in the lab when the men weren't there. And she created the map of the world's ocean floor and importantly, discovered the Mid-Atlantic Rift. Then that was the proof of plate tectonics. And nobody believed it. They kept making her redo her calculations. This is Marie Tharp. And finally, it was accepted. So um, women are doing, doing things now that are just extraordinary. And it's very, very exciting time. It's an exciting time to be a young woman. Oh, Absolutely. T tell us more about your role in the Explorers Club. When did you join um, the club? I should have joined earlier, but I was very involved with Wings World Quest so, um, and a predecessor, another women's organization. But I joined in 94 and as a fellow, and I'm also a fellow of the RGS, the Royal Geographic Society, and also of the Canadian Royal Canadian Geographic Society. RGS has been a, is a little bit ahead of the Explorers Club because they started letting women in in the 1920s, and the Explorers Club didn't start till 1981. And we just finished a film on four of the first women members of, of the Explorers Club that aired last night, and you can also see that online. But now I'm on the board, and I do a lot of different programs, and I'm chair of this year-long program of, of honoring women at the club. And I also work with Adventure Canada, and, and we take up every summer a group of young people in their 20s up to the Arctic, and I supervise their project. And that's been really wonderful because we've had all kinds of amazing young people come through that program. There are a lot of opportunities out there for people. You, you have to look, but they're there. In terms of your own expeditions and explorations that you've done, which one stands out in your mind? I don't know how easy this is going to be to answer. Which one stands out in your memory as being particularly challenging, which really took you quite far outside of your comfort zone? Huh, that's very difficult. Well, I suppose the camel track across the Western desert, because this was um, 1979 and we didn't have sat phones. We didn't have the, the U.S. Embassy wanted me to haul along some device which would have taken one camel to haul it and it, all it would do is send an SOS to some mythical satellite that may or may not be circulating overhead saying that we we're in trouble but not really saying where we were or anything else and so I decided not to do that so in those days before computers really and before s telephones and all of our technology that we have now anytime you go out you're out. And I think that people forget that now. They forget how to be away from everybody else. And that's when you can be really, really challenged because you have to know how to survive on your own. And I think that that's a, that's a really good thing to learn how to do, for everybody to learn how to do, whether or not you use it in your everyday life, it gives you a sense of confidence in yourself. So I would say that all those early expeditions, when, when I went to Yemen, you know, I, I, when I arrived in Sana'a, I knew where I was spending the first couple of nights, but after that, I didn't really, I mean, I knew roughly where I wanted to go because I'd read a lot, but I was on my own. And there's, there's, a, um, there's a feeling I think a lot of people have when you're completely on your own at the very beginning of something where your part of your brain is saying it'd be so nice just to go home and get back in bed and be where everything is I know and the other half of your brain is saying wow there's so much here I really want to see and do it's often a struggle and obviously for me that half that said there's so much here to see and do one 
but you have to recognize that you know you humans are are also cautious you know so you have you have to be you have to be careful you're not not reckless when you are in these like difficult challenging situations and that you know you maybe do feel on your own or alone or even feeling lonely when you're when you're out on expeditions how do you keep positive and do you keep positive you know what drives you forward what keeps you going there's always something new to learn every single minute and having a camera which I always had just I've been a photographer since I've been very young it gives you a way of looking at the world through the lens of the camera and capturing what's beautiful I was always looking for what was beautiful around me or interesting or, or different so that was my I was just just curious about about everything when I would have those questioned moments, I would think back on what I what I had already accomplished and where I wanted to go, and so then I would just keep going. So, with the Explorers Club, you're working on uh, what's it? It's it's it's, it's a year long um, initiative, isn't it? The it's a year long program to to highlight the role of women in exploration. Tell us more about the year ahead and what your hopes are for this year. What it, what you hope the outcomes are going to be from this from this year long sort of focus on women. There are several goals that I have. First, I, I think it's very important to build a fellowship of women because women are often you're part of a, a whole group, but and a lot of times the men have a group, but it's harder for the women to have a group. And so, what I'm trying to do is really highlight the incredible accomplishments of women in a, ver- in a variety of endeavors. For our, our event on Antarctica, we had 36,000 people around the world watched it. And that was, was really a, an eye-opener, that people are really interested to know what women are doing and accomplishing around the world. And that, then to build a camaraderie or fellowship amongst themselves to support each other and uh, last night when we were had our program on I did help to help do a film called Pathfinders and in the conversation afterwards one of the women turned to another one an archaeologist turned to a deep sea explorer and said I really need to do underwater exploration of the Amazon where these ancient people because the waters have risen where they used to be. And she said, okay, we can get a sub submersible because she has a company that builds submersibles. And so an expedition was there put together in real time online, which was very exciting. And that's the kind of thing I want to see happen is women supporting women and moving forward together. Because I think, I think it's really, uh, of course, my goal is that everybody eventually will be the same on the same plane, men, women of whatever race or gender or anything like that, everybody's the same. But until we can get to that point in humanity, we have to really help those that aren't on parity with white men. So I think it's really important that women come together and really support each other. Oh, hundred percent. I even think back to, um, I didn't really know about female explorers and adventurers until probably my early 30s. And I'm almost like embarrassed by that thinking, you know, I'd like to think I'm well educated and well read. And I just just hadn't read about them, hadn't seen them. It just hadn't it never sort of came across my place. And so I think it's just so important to get these stories out there, to build these connections, to build these relationships. And like you say, just, you know, to connect women together, to support one another, to encourage them to go off and to take on, you know, their own their own personal challenges and, and expeditions. Are you still going on expeditions? Are you still sort of exploring? Um obviously po- post COVID. <laughs> I really hope so. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I there's one wonderful organization that I went off on a short expedition with before COVID called Adventure Science and they take athletes and go do science because he uses areas that are very difficult to get to and so that if you're a long distance runner or climber or something like that it makes use of your special capabilities. And we went out to Bears Ears National Monument 
in Utah, which is an area filled with archaeology. And of course, I was much older than everybody else there. And so they would all take off in the morning and go scaling the mesas, looking for various things. And I went kind of not flat because it was filled with gullies and gulches and everything area. And I found two villages and lots and lots of artifacts. So it's a wonderful organization. It's Canadian and lots of young people go on their expeditions looking. He has a, a variety of them or he will have once COVID is over around the world. And there are other, other opportunities like that for, for younger people to get out in the world and, and really really see things. So my goal is is to really help those kinds of things move forward as best I can. Now I know you've written quite a lot of books and contributed to so many different, you know, magazines and book chapters. Are you writing at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> always. I do a regular uh series of book reviews for the Explorers Journal and I've got I've got a book that's nearly finished on my great grandmother who was, um, for her time, fairly intrepid. I, there are a lot of women in my family that really went out and did did marvelous things, And but it was not really exploration. It was more adventure. I um, got that, and, and then I would really, really like to do a book, which I've done a lot of the research for on women of the Arctic. There were a number of women explorers in the Arctic, and they're never included in any of the books on exploration. The same way women are never included on the general books on exploration. I often get requests to write the woman chapter for a history. And it makes me so angry because I, I said, well, which woman do you want me to write about? And they said, well, it doesn't matter. Just pick one. And I think that's just so awful. <laughs> you know, just how can I pick one to represent all women in the history of exploration? There's so many. I would love to reprint my book, Women of Discovery, and update update it with some more current ones and put in some earlier ones that I've discovered that didn't I didn't know about when I wrote this book. There's just so much out there and there's I'm very glad to see that other people are writing books like this now on specific biographies of people that were otherwise lost and I'm I'm really happy that that's happening because that's that's important. Sometimes I get really angry and frustrated when um so I'm, I'll be coming up to around like 500 interviews in the next couple of months of, of you know, of women who, who shared their stories of these big physical challenges and adventure and exploration. And I just know that it's just, it's only like the tip of the iceberg. It's just such a small, tiny amount of women in their stories. And there's so many out there. How have you dealt with that frustration of, uh, of wanting to get more women's stories out there, but being, I suppose, blocked by oh, men <laughs> just say it <laughs> yeah you know that the thing that's so interesting is and I think over time it's going to become easier when I first wrote women of discovery now 20 years ago I was trying to turn it in parts of it into a television series because there's so many amazing stories of women living today that would be would be great to feature. And at that time, I was told by all the major companies that were doing this sort of thing, basically what they wanted was babes and death. Because they wanted something really scary and they wanted somebody really beautiful. And I think that that kind of attitude is changing a little bit. And so they're they're much more open to just taking, here's somebody interesting, look what they're doing, let's follow that, and not care so much that they look like they're a 21-year-old about to be eaten by a shark. And I think that just through education, things are going to change. But it's still very, very difficult because that's what I'm saying is that women have to support women more. And if there's a demand for for these books that talk about, you know, what, what women are really doing and discovering and finding out if people buy those books, then the publishers will be more open to publishing more books. And then it's sort of like a a cycle. The more you do, the more you get, and it goes around and around. And, and I think that women have to be careful not to be silly. Sometimes they are, 
as men are sometimes silly too, but women have, it's like everything. A woman has to be 10 times better than the man to get recognized. And so we have to really be, um, you know, thoughtful and careful. And of course, most are. And I, I, so I think that just supporting each other is, is the way we're going to break down barriers and educating young people to evaluate things on its merit rather than on its package. Absolutely. So I know that you've written a lot of book reviews that have, that have appeared in the Explorer's Journal. Is there a particular book that stands out for you that, um, that's really impacted on you and your life or a book that you really recommend, you know, the one book that you would recommend to uh, your uh, friends? And I know, and I'm just, I'm, as I'm asking the question, I'm thinking that's such a difficult question. I was like, good luck answering that because there's probably so, so many different books that you've read and written. Oh, gosh, which book? I'm just looking around. All the, I've got thousands of books in this room. You know, I think the thing about books also is that that's an area of discovery. And people really should read and don't, don't rely on things being on your Kindle or computers because a lot of books written by women don't make it onto a Kindle. And a lot of books that really need to be read don't make it there because, of course, I'm talking about nonfiction so delving into the world of, of knowledge through books is, is an, an amazing exploration in its own. And I think that everybody needs to do that. And through that, you will also discover your passion. You'll learn about people that, and what they did in their lives. Like Mary Wortley Montague, who lived in England in the late 1600s and went to Turkey with her husband, who was then the ambassador to Turkey. And she discovered the cure for smallpox and brought it back to England and was denounced as a witch. And it was only later that, I think, what was it, Jenner was reading her writing and then he's credited now with it 70 years later after her time. So you read stories like that and you go, oh, I want to know more about her. How did she go to Turkey? English women didn't travel at that time. Only unusual ones did. Or you want to read about uh, a whole different area, say, of of pilgrimage. And one thing I learned about pilgrimage that was really interesting, and it's still a very vital part of most religions in the world, and those cultures have pilgrimages. When you went on pilgrimage, and still to this day, one act of pilgrimage is, is penance and confession of sins or whatever you did and get cleansed and purified and how liberating it was, especially in medieval times when you can leave your little parish and leave your priest who you had to confess to every every week or whatever, and you'd go to a foreign country and a foreign priest who wouldn't understand what you're saying, so you could confess everything you wanted to him. He wouldn't know what it was, and he wouldn't be able to tell anybody about you, whereas at home your parish priest would know all your secrets, and how liberating that must have been for, for people. And women went on pilgrimages and always have in all cultures in droves because that was one legitimate way they could get out and see the world and experience things. So through books, you discover the story of Marguerite of Kemp, or you discover Japanese uh, women pilgrims who, who did write a lot. And the lots of, you know, once you walk into this kind of library, that's why I want to keep this as a library somewhere, is each story that you pull out opens a world to you that you didn't even know was there. Yeah. So. I can't really pick a, a book. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. I think it's just, you know, it's a, it's about reading more. It's about discovering more. It's about following your interests and your passions and just taking that time out to, to, yes. to, to spend time reading. It will just give you so much pleasure and so much enjoyment and open so many doors and expose so many different worlds and so many different opportunities. Do you ever think back to Oxford and doing your PhD? Have you ever wanted to go back and do it? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm probably too old now to do it. The amount of time it would have taken at any particular point in my life, I had so many other things going on that I could never think of stopping and doing that. The time really for doing it would have been back then before I got involved in so many different things. It would be nice. I mean, I would love to go and be in an academic environment and just focus on one thing, but I, I can't imagine doing that now. I just have so many interests and so many different things. It would be hard. And the subject, of course, that I would have pursued wouldn't be the same subject now. 
and I'm not sure what that would be. Women of Exploration. <laughs> yeah, no, I really would like to do my book on women of the Arctic because I think it will be – Arctic history is so important. There's so many books that come out on Arctic history every single year, and it still fascinates people, the search for the Northwest Passage and Franklin and all these stories. There are so many women that were there too, and nobody knows their stories. And so many indigenous women that enabled all of this exploration – and nobody knows their stories. Uh, that's the kind of thing that really fascinates me yeah. right now. Have you got a publisher for that book? No, no. Is it written? Is it finished? Um, I've lectured on this on the topic. No, the book itself isn't finished because it's it's usually not a good idea to to write a book until you have a publisher because they might have their own slant on things or how they would like things to be done. But I've certainly lectured on it a lot, and I have a lot of the a lot of the materials. My, you know, like stories like Gudrid, who was a uh, Icelandic woman, lived around 1000 A.D. And she went to Greenland, and then she lived in North America at Lanso Meadow. She gave birth to the first child in North America, Snorri. And then she went back to Iceland to Norway. She converted to Christianity. She walked to Rome on pilgrimage. She might have brought the first word of, of North America to the center of learning, which was around the Pope at that time. And if so, there's theorized that a number of, of monks were sent out to find this cold northern land. Of course, nothing was ever heard from them again. Um, and then she went back to Iceland and had an abbey, probably just a little hut at the end of her life. And so she was an incredibly well-traveled woman for over a thousand years ago. Stories like that. You know, you usually in the books you hear about her husband who was a, a Norseman and a trader, but he didn't have her, the range of her experience. And he, he died probably at sea before she went on her great pilgr pilgrimage to Rome. So why don't we know about her story? You know, and there, then there are lots of women in the 1800s and the 1900s that, that, that went north. But they went, see, women went in a different way than men. They weren't involved in conquest. They weren't involved in search for treasure. They weren't supported by the governments. They didn't have big expeditions behind them. They didn't have the Navy or the, the Army that would send out many of these expeditions and then those same people, the men that sent out all those expeditions, of course, were the ones that formed the societies, like Sir Joseph Banks and all those other people. And women were never part of that world. And they also published all the books that came back from all these expeditions and gave out medals and accolades to all the men that were doing them. Women were always on the margins, but it doesn't mean that they weren't doing it. 100%. Well, I'm, I hope your book does get published because I think there would be an audience for it. I think people would love to read about it. And Milby, how can people follow along with you, support your work, keep up to date with what you're with what you're up to? Oh, well I have to update my my website because it <laughs> what sadly, and I'm not a technology person as you probably gather from all of this. And my website is written on a program that I've been told no longer exists. So I have to transfer everything and update everything and that means I have to find somebody to do it and it's just hasn't been on my priority list but that is probably the best way it's milburypulk.com and I guess once I stop I'm on a couple of boards right now but I think I'm going to cycle off them and then I'll have a little bit more time to focus on on that which would be probably a smart thing to do since everybody's so technology oriented now you'll be on instagram before you know it doing instagram stories and sharing on facebook and tweeting out <laughs> but milbury before we go i'd love for you to have um the final words you know, final words of advice for women out there who want more adventure they want more exploration in their life they want to discover more of themselves and more of the world you know what would be your advice and top tips i think the most important thing is you have to Really do soul searching and figure out what your passion is. What do you really love to do? And a friend of mine years ago told me that what he did was he got a piece of paper 
and divided it down the middle. On one side, he listed all the things he liked to do, and on the other side, all the things he didn't like to do. And it could be as simple as, I want to have a pet or I don't want to have a pet. Because having a pet limits you in a certain way, or it not limits you, but it sends you off in a different direction. And so if you do that and really look at that list, that will help you decide where, what avenue you'd like to try. And then once you get to that point, I do tell everybody that there's really no such thing as failure. Failure is a time to, or what we call failure, is a time to reset, or they say reboot, and take a slightly different shift. It's uh, something I think that's your yourself is telling you, this is not the way that you are supposed to go. You're supposed to slightly shift over here or over here. So listen to failure and listen to yourself because lots of times your inner self is telling you something and, and you don't listen. So really listen to yourself and think, is this right for me? And then once you've done all that and you figure out okay, what I really want to do is I really want to get my diver's license and I want to go out and help save corals. Just say, for example, that I've done all this soul searching and that's really what I care about most of anything. Well, the wonderful thing is that there's the internet now and there are so many organizations that do the kinds of things that whatever you decide you want to do and many opportunities to go out and have your first experience be something that is sort of guided. So say it's saving corals. There are a number of places you can go and live aboard a boat and go down and, and do seed coraling and, and other things. I mean, seeding the corals. And that gives you the first step in. And then you can say, I really like this. I want to take the next step. And so it's a, it's a step-by-step process. And it doesn't mean it has to be slow, but it, it does mean that you have to do things in a, in a thoughtful, orderly fashion so that you get to your end goal and you have a solid base underneath you. And if it's not, if your interest is not in science, but it's more in adventure, there again, there are lots of ways to go out into the world. And the most important thing, I think, is to have respect for the people amongst whom you're traveling or amongst whom you're living or visiting, and really listen. People today don't listen as much as they should, but to really listen to what other people have to say and what other people are doing and do your homework, do a lot of reading so you really understand the history and you understand what what it is you're doing. You should watch the film Pathfinders because there's a young woman at the end of the film named Kristen Gates who holds a lot of records for trekking across vast stretches of land, whether she's the first woman to trek across the entire Brooks Range, for example, in Alaska, or um, she hiked down this, the, the coast of Greenland after one of our expeditions there. And she, she does a lot of solo trekking, and she's become a, a very good filmmaker. And now she's taking all of, putting all that together and and making very impactful films about things that are very important in different parts of the world that we may not hear about so much. So there's a way that you build up your your expertise in different, whether it's trekking and outdoor living and then mastering photography and filmmaking and, and pu- putting it together in a way that makes sense to you. So it's getting the tools. A lot of, a lot of exploration is getting the tools that you'll need to have success. Absolutely love it, Milbury. Thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast. It's been just honestly fascinating to learn more about your life and the journey that you've been on and the amazing work that you're doing to share more women's stories and women's voices. It's incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey. 
Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Milbury. My name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges. For me personally, I just found it absolutely fascinating to hear about how the world of exploration has changed and what Milbury has done to increase the amount of women in this space from Wings World Quest, which is an incredible organization, to the work that she's doing in the Explorers Club. Like I'm, I've been 100% inspired by Milbury and what she has achieved. And actually, I'm going to be sharing more about how Milbury has inspired me in the in an episode which is going live tomorrow i'm doing a solo episode to help celebrate the six-year anniversary of the tough girl podcast that will be going live on the 4th of august at 7 a.m in the morning so make sure that you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out but anyway there's another podcast episode which i'd love for you to listen to so this is a tough girl podcast extra episode which came out on march 8th 2018 when we spoke to jane robinson so uh, Jane was born in Edinburgh. She was brought up in North Yorkshire. She became a book dealer and later a writer. Her 10 books to date have been critically acclaimed and have confirmed her as one of our most engaging and original social historians. So her most recent book came out in January 2018. There, there might be a few more books after that. But this book in 2018, which came out, was Hearts and Minds, The Untold Story of the Great Pilgrimage and How Women Won the Vote. This is a story of ordinary people affecting extraordinary extraordinary change. By turning dangerous, exhausting and exhilarating, the Great Pilgrimage transformed the personal and political lives of women in Britain forever. Jane Robinson has drawn from diaries, letters and unpublished accounts to tell the inside story of the march against the colourful background of the entire suffrage campaign. And one of the great things that we talk about earlier on in the episode is around how she started to get interested in women travellers and women adventurers. And she originally started creating this first bibliography of women travellers and and wayward women she wrote a first-hand travel accounts written by women and it's honestly it's incredible it sort of links into what Milvery was talking about with her library and these incredible books and these incredible resources which are you know unfortunately sort of being lost to to history because these stories aren't being shared and I actually recently re-listened to this episode um and found it absolutely inspiring. And it also just reminded me these little sections that I do at the end are almost like a timestamp of what was happening at that point in time. So yeah, take a listen to that episode. It's a Tough Girl Podcast Extra episode with James Robinson, which came out on International Women's Day in 2018. I think you'll really enjoy it. And like I said earlier, I've got a solo episode coming out tomorrow, and I'll be sharing more about how Milbury has inspired me with Tough Girl Challenges and one of the things that I'm going to be doing next. So really excited to share that with you. But thank you again for taking the time to listen find out more about me and tough girl podcast then please visit toughgirlchallenges.com there's also more information how you can support how you can sign up as a patron and you can find out more about some of the different adventures that i've been involved in but new episodes go live every tuesday and thursday we've got with a few bonus episodes coming out this week um tomorrow there's going to be not only my solo episode coming out but four bonus episodes as well seven o'clock eleven o'clock one o'clock and three o'clock roughly so um to celebrate the six year anniversary of the tough girl podcast we've been going for six years which is amazing so thank you so much again for listening take care have an awesome day and i'll speak to you tomorrow all right take care lots of love bye